My wife and I have known each other for a long time. There's proof of it. Uh, that's sitting around the campfire at her parents' house. My wife still is beautiful. Wow, unbelievable. A couple things I want you to notice. Number one, my haircut, skater's cut. Uh, that was pretty fly back then. Uh, she still uh, is helping me do basic, simple tasks, showing me how to roast a marshmallow. I also want you to notice uh, the socks that she's wearing and the uh, Bigfoot slippers that I'm wearing. It's pretty cool. Uh, this is us in 2002. Uh, Jess getting a tan and me hoping to avoid being burnt because of how pale I am. Uh, this was us when we lived in uh, Albany, New York. This is uh, the first Bible fellowship I ever ran. That's me looking there. I was so proud. I was holding my Bible, my King James Cambridge leather-bound Bible. <laughs> There's Joelle, Russ's wife. There's my wife. Uh, there is Amy's brother, Chris. Some of us have been friends for a long time. So that's in like 2003, maybe. And then we started to date and... Uh, that was us in Lake George. This is in my apartment, uh, my college apartment, probably 2004 or so. And then this, look at this picture right here. Does anybody notice those guys there? <laughs> this is, we called him uh, Joseph uh, and Lena. And I should have known better. Here I am wearing a Peyton Manning jersey, and this woman is wearing a Jets jersey, or a Patriots jersey. I should have known. Should have known. And this is uh, when we got engaged, um, and then we got married. And uh, we dated. Uh, we were friends since we were little, uh, but we dated when I was in college, around 2004 or so. And we spent a lot of time together. Uh, we were going to Bible fellowships, going to church together, hanging out with friends, having uh, people uh, get together, go out to a restaurant, uh, hanging out together in our, our apartments or our dorms, wherever we were living. We hung out all the time. She was obsessed with me. <clears throat> <laughs> and we had been uh, formally dating for a few months, and I'll never forget, she asked me this question. I'm telling you, we're hanging out all the time, spending time together all the time early in the morning till late at night. And she said to me, months of dating, do you think that sometime we could go out on a date? <laughs> and I'm thinking, uh, we were on a date yesterday. And uh, I remember responding, not with like, of course, dear. I remember going, what do you mean? We were on a date yesterday. She's like, no. Yesterday, we were hanging out with everyone else and all of our other friends at the church, and uh, you know, then we had a meal together, and then we all uh, hung out, and you kissed me before I drove away. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but though uh, those of you, those guys that are smarter than me and all the ladies know, that wasn't a date, and so we went out on our first date. We went to see Cheaper by the Dozen uh, with Steve Martin, and we got pizza at a place called Manja, and uh, in Slingerlands, New York. And uh, what I realized is that, I realized then, I realized today, that uh, healthy relationships don't happen on accident. Amen? Whether you're a parent and a child, whether you're a husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whether you're just a friend, good and healthy relationships don't happen on accident. They require intentionality. Last week, we looked at the story of uh, Moses delivering uh, the people of Israel from Egypt, and we talked about how God led them out of Egypt, but he didn't take them the shortest route. He took them on a longer route through a wilderness because he knew not only what lied ahead on their road, but also what these uh, sla enslaved people, newly free, could handle. And we talked about how having a guide is better than just having guidance. Amen? And we saw Moses with his amazing, wonderful heart for God. And God, after Israel had sinned by making the golden calf and worshiping it as him, uh, he was saying, I'll send you into the promised land. I'll fulfill my word to you, but I'm not going. An angel is going. And Moses said this. Moses said to the Lord, if your presence will not go with us, do not 
bring us up from here. That'd be a great thing for our church to believe, right? God, if your presence is not going with us, don't bring us somewhere else. We do not want to go unless you're going. God, we want to be with you. Amen? We're talking about deepening our relationship with God today and growing in our maturity with him. We want to walk with him. We want to hear his voice. We want to spend time with him in a way that is not laborious and religious, but is beautiful and wonderful. Moses said, if your presence will not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. That's what made the people of Israel special. Not because of how they wore their hair, or wore their clothes, or what they ate, or even where they lived. It was that God was near. There's, there's buildings throughout, throughout the world that people are gathering in today. God forbid there are even buildings all over the world that people are gathering in that have a, a steeple at the top with a cross, but the Lord is not in that place. I want to be where God is. I want to go where God leads. And what makes God's people in the Old Testament and the people of God today who name the name of Jesus Christ special and distinct is not that we own Bibles. It's not that we have Jesus fish on our car. It's not that we listen to Caleb and, oh, my goodness, maybe even give during the pledge drive. It's not even that you're here this morning. What makes us special is that God is with us. What makes you special is that you are a child of the Most High God. If we ever step away and have something else be more important, like the size of our congregation or the, the preaching ability of our pastor or the musical ability of our worship team, and that's what we think makes us special, ooh, boy, you better watch yourself. My wife said that to me a lot while we are dating, too. God, we want to go where you are. Amen? Amen? It's your presence that sets us out, sets us apart as different. And we saw that Moses had a special place and time to meet with God. It was called the tent of meeting. Now, don't be confused. This isn't the tabernacle. This is a separate thing that Moses intentionally set up to foster his relationship with God. And uh, Exodus 33 told us that Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out, out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Inside the tent, this is what was going on, Exodus 33, 11. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses, how? Face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again to the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. The reason why Moses had the courage and the confidence to ask the Lord not to send an angel, but to go with him. Think about how bold that is. God Almighty says, I'm not going with you. I'm sending you an angel. And Moses says, um, yeah, Yahweh, creator of all. Sovereign ruler of the universe and the heavens, the one that knows everything about everything and knows the number of hairs upon my head and upon my beard. I'm not going to go unless you go. To me, that does not sound like someone who just had faith in this God or knew about this God. Moses knows God. It sounds like Moses has the confidence to pray something so audacious. Now, God could have said no. But even the fact that Moses praised this prayer shows us that he had developed a relationship with this God. Huh. Maybe the kind of relationship that would be characterized by meeting with someone face to face and speaking like a friend. 
This didn't happen overnight. This didn't happen on accident. Moses, what we just read in Exodus 33, this was the pattern of his life. This was intentionality. Relationships don't happen on accident. Raise your hand if uh, those of you that have been married for some time, one day uh, you were living in your apartment, a single person, and all of a sudden you woke up the next morning and someone was laying in your bed and kids were running around the hallway. Did that just happen accidentally? It's like, who is it? It's Amazon. I'm here with the family that someone ordered you. It doesn't happen, at least not yet. Wait a few years. Moses, it says, used to take the tent and go outside the camp. Look at the intentionality involved in that. He, he made the decision to meet with God. He paused his normal life and routine to get a tent and then go outside of the camp and set it up. And then he would sit in the tent and talk with God. There was intentionality to the relationship. But you know what? is also required for a good and healthy relationship besides intentionality, spontaneity. Spontaneity. We read in this passage earlier on that, that the people, whenever they had to, they wanted to inquire of God, they would go out. So Moses may have been going out to the tent and then, you know, Bob shows up or Joe shows up or Jared shows up and says, I have to ask the Lord something too. Moses, could you help me? And that brought spontaneity into the relationship with God. This morning, my focus is going to be that a relationship with God is intentional and spontaneous. A relationship with God is intentional, but it is also spontaneous. Because good relationships need both. In our relationships, whether marriage or friendship or whatever, when we lack intentionality, relationships suffer. How many of you uh, don't talk to someone uh, that you used to talk to a lot many years ago? Because you went to high school with them and now you graduated and you moved to another town and, oh my gosh, it, they didn't come with you. Maybe the pandemic severed or changed some relationships because of a change in your normal routine. If, if the quality of your relationships depends on just the normal things that happen in your life and there's a change to those normal things, the relationship's going to change. Re relationships require intentionality. And when you don't have intentionality in your relationships, relationships suffer. But when we lack, when we lack spontaneity, relationships suffer too. If if the only time you talk to someone is when you make an appointment with them, the quality of your relationship might be uh, shaped more like a business than a friendship or a love-based relationship. You know the only time I talk to my doctor? When my wife makes me an appointment. That's right. <laughs> we need intentionality, but we also need spontaneity. And when we only have one or the other, the relationships suffer. So in our relationship with God, we need to have intentional discipline and spirit-led spontaneity. We need discipline and habits, and we need newness and freshness in the moment. Because our relationship with God is based on love and not transactional. Do you know what a transactional relationship is? You have a transactional relationship with wherever you go grocery shopping. They say, we'll provide the grapefruits. You come, you give them the money, and guess what they give you? Grapefruits. You could even check it out yourself now. Some people's motivation in relationships is purely transactional, and those are not healthy qualities to have in a relationship. Uh, you get your spouse flowers when you want to get something from them. You come home and there's a candlelit dinner on the table and rather than thinking, hey, this is nice, you think, uh-oh, they did something wrong and they're going to tell me over candlelight dinner. If, if someone calls you in the middle of the day, you, you look at it and you go, uh-oh, this can't be good. If you get a text from a friend and all it says is, hey, period, or hey, 
dot, dot, dot. And that's it. They're fishing to see, is this person right there at their phone? Because I'm saying, hey, if they say yes, I'm going to respond back with the real thing I need from them. But if they don't respond and say, hey, they must not be there, so I'll just wait it out. Maybe you call someone and they answer like this. Hey, how are you? And you say, fine, what's up? That speaks to a transaction, transactional kind of relationship. Like you're bothering me when you're calling me. I just want to know what you need. What's, what's up? I, nobody in this room would do this. But there are times when I'm uh, here at the church uh, after a service, and nobody's going to talk to me after this because of what I'm about to say. <laughs> I'm willing to take the risk. And um, I'm standing there. I'm thinking about something. Maybe I'm, I have my notes. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm just standing by myself or whatever. And then I see someone. Like I said, nobody here that's here today. Uh, I see them come up, and I can see it in their eyes. They want to talk to me. And they've got something important they want to talk to me about. And they push through all the noise. They push through all the other people that might be there. And they finally get to me and they say, Pastor, I needed to talk to you since I got here today. Thank you for giving me your time. Did you know that the water dispenser in the other room is at 41 degrees and not 40? Like I said, nobody in this room would do anything like that. <laughs> I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> Our relationship somewhere, uh, somewhere in Florida, Pam's laughing right now. Our relationship with God... <laughs> Our relationship with God is not to be based on transaction. I pray so my life goes well. I read the Bible so he does something. I tithe so he makes sure my bills are paid. I speak the gospel to someone and then God will love me. God already loves you. That's why you come to him. When we spend time with God, it is, it is to spend time with someone who loves us and who we love. That should be the setting for us meeting with God. Moses met with God face to face like someone meets with his friend. That's, that's, that is uh, audacious for him to say. How bold of Moses to write, my relationship with the creator was like one of a friend. Relationships require intentionality and spontaneity. And good, healthy relationships are not transactional. They're based on love. And so uh, this morning, I want to go through some verses to look at Jesus's life, about his relationship with his father, to show us these things. Uh, we'll turn to a passage in a moment, but I want you to see these verses uh, on the wall. Jesus made an intentional habit to spend time with his father. Mark 1, 35, you know I love this verse. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus did what? That requires intentionality. Then what did he do? He, that requires intentionality. And then he went away to a secluded place. That requires intentionality and was doing what? Jesus had an intentional habit in his relationship with his father to get up in the early morning while it was still dark. He left the house and he went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Relationships don't happen on accident. They require intentionality. And they also require spontaneity. He also had a relationship with God that was unplanned. Luke 5, 15 and 16, but the news about him was spreading even farther and large crowds were gathering to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. 
But Jesus himself would often what? He would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. He would get up in the morning to spend the time with his father. But you know what? As, as his ministry is growing and things are gathering, there were certain days where he's like, I need to slip away for a little while. You ever feel like that just about life? Right? You just need to slip away for a while. Right? Maybe you call it like a bag of chips and a show. That's what it's called, right? Slipping away, right? Relationship, Jesus' relationship with his father required intentional habits, but also unplanned practices. His relationship with God also uh, could be characterized by his response when a crisis happened. Luke 6 tells us that the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath so might, they might find a reason to do what? That's a big deal. They're watching Jesus to accuse him if he makes a mistake. Jesus has a man with a withered hand before him, and after looking around at them all, he said to him to do what? Stretch out your hand, and he did so, and his hand was restored. But they themselves were filled with what? Rage. They were filled with what? Rage. Let me see your rage face. Oh, nice. Wow. Okay. Some of you had the same face uh, before, so... <laughs> We'll work on that. And they discuss together what they might do to Jesus. These are the religious leaders who have influence, power, and authority in the religious culture of Jesus' day. They are watching to see if he's going to make a mistake because they want to accuse him and discredit him and spread rumors about him. And when he does this they, and he heals this man on the Sabbath, they're so filled with rage that they convene a meeting to figure out what we are going to do about Jesus. Enough of those meetings will lead to them having a final meeting that says we need to arrest him and kill him. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. That wasn't on the schedule. Nor was it just, oh, I'm going to slip away. I've got some time here I can spend uh, with, with my father. It was, there's something going on. I need to pray. I'm probably the best at this one out of the three we've looked at so far. Crisis, pray. Well, I'm trying to follow Jesus. That's what he does in these moments. And then we see these beautiful uh, moments of spontaneity. He sends out 70 uh, disciples, 72 disciples to preach the gospel and to heal. And when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. These disciples had never experienced anything like this. Jesus was out healing and delivering people from the demons. And then he gets 72 of his followers and say, I'm giving you authority to go do it now. Go be a bunch of mini Jesuses. And they come back and they're like, it worked. And they come back with such joy. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. And then he says, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. What a, what a day that must have been for Jesus and, his, Jesus and his disciples. And at the same time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit and said, Oh, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. You see what happened there? Jesus spontaneously started to pray. Such joy and rejoicing, seeing the, the devil's territory being uh, attacked and, and bought back and won back for, for God. And Jesus says... Oh, Father, you're good. How great you are that you're going to use a bunch of no-name people like these 72 to, to do great things, to bring glory to yourself. Just broke out in praise, broke out in prayer, started speaking to his father just because his heart was filled with joy. He didn't have to look at his calendar and say, oh, no, I'm not supposed to be praying right now. Because you don't do that when you have a relationship with someone based on love. Yes, there's intentionality and planning and habits, but there's also spontaneity. You look beautiful today. Hey, the kids aren't here. Do you want to go and get a coffee together? Right? A text in the middle of the day that just says, hey, I was thinking about you. 
I love you. A text to a brother or sister in Christ is saying, hey, you just came to my mind. I wanted to just say that you're a child of the most high God. Oh my gosh, when you get those texts, don't they just bring wind to the sails of your heart sometimes? Don't you know that sometimes that's God speaking to you while the devil's trying to whisper to you at the same moment when you send that text or that call and it's spontaneous and unplanned? And sometimes you feel more love in those moments of spontaneity because you can tell it was driven by the heart and not some plan. Hey, in 72 weeks, I have an hour on a Thursday that I have another appointment, but I could probably have you in the room while I'm talking to the other person. Oh, thanks. Well, I wanted to talk to you about the water temperature of the, the water cooler. <laughs> and lastly, in this relationship, uh, we see Jesus modeling. In John 11, we see that also his relationship with his father is conversational. This is after his friend Lazarus has died and been uh, in the grave for f- four days, and they remove the stone. Everyone's crying and mourning and they remove the stone and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they may believe that you sent me. After this, he said this, he shouted with a loud voice. Let's all say it together. Lazarus, come out. When I say conversational, what I'm thinking about is Jesus is with all these other people. He's doing these things, but He is talking to his father in a way that doesn't seem formalized like a prayer. Father, I know that you heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but I said this so that they would know that I am with you. A conversation, not something so formal. You see, Jesus was intentional and spontaneous in his relationship with God. And so let's go to Matthew chapter 6 now. Jesus is teaching us about a relationship with God. Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, which he's talking to us and his disciples about how to be his disciple. He says something very important in verse 1. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, Tell your neighbor, be intentional. (laughs) And say back to them, be spontaneous. spontaneous. (laughs) Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus says to us this morning, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Beware of practicing your righteousness and the good things you're doing. Beware of doing it before men so that you're noticed by them. Obviously, we practice righteousness with other people around and involved, but we don't do it to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you'll have no reward with your Father who's in heaven. And then Jesus is going to talk about the different things that uh, his disciples would understand of practicing righteousness. He talks about giving to the poor. And then in verse 5, he talks about prayer. And he says, when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. They're praying these beautiful, loud, theologically correct, poetic prayers. And they're supposedly doing it so that God will hear them, so that God will work and God will move. And Jesus is saying, if you're praying just so other people hear you, if that's what your relationship with God is all about, to be noticed by other people, then if anyone does notice you and says, wow, that's all you get. Now, there are times I've heard you say it, I've said it, uh, Maybe someone has said it to you that a prayer that you pray really bless them. And maybe you've said, man, your prayer tonight was so beautiful. That was exactly what I needed to hear. That's a great thing to say. That's a great encouragement and compliment. As long as the person who prayed that beautiful prayer's intention wasn't to get you to say that. And Father, as I finish this prayer meeting today, I just say that anybody that was moved by the prayer that I prayed would come up to me afterwards and confirm that I prayed really well today in the name of Jesus and me. Amen. It certainly isn't that obvious. 
We don't do it to be seen by men. But when you pray, go into your what? All right, let's get together. Verse six, but when you, but you, when you pray, go into your what? You're in a room and then do what? Close your door and do what? Pray to your father who's in secret. We're not talking about Moses anymore. We're not talking about Jesus, the Messiah anymore. We're talking about you and me. When you and I pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You see, Jesus is teaching his disciples and his followers that the relationship with God is intentional. When you pray, assumes they're going to be praying. And then he says, go to a special place and shut the door. I hope we have a place like that. I hope you have a place in your room or in your house or in your life that you can go to to pray. That you can shut the door and be alone. And, and if you don't have that, you need to be intentional to find it. Or to go there. Maybe it's, if you live in a studio apartment with 27 people, <laughs> go to your car and shut the door. You don't have a car, you live in a studio apartment with 27 people, go to the library and get one of those study rooms that are free at the Warwick Public Library on Sandy Lane and sit in there and shut the door. If, if you find it hard to pray, if your relationship with God is dry right now, but you don't have a place that you can go to and shut the door and a time that you have decided to go and shut the door, then don't come to me and ask me, why isn't my relationship with God vibrant and flourishing? That's why. He says, when you pray, go into the inner room, close your door and pray to your father who's in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, don't use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. In verse seven and eight, he's talking to us about the spontaneous part of the relationship. When you find that place and that time and you make that time to be intentional in your relationship with God, intentionality is required for healthy relationships. When you get there, Jesus is saying now to have some spontaneity in that moment, meaning pray with your honest heart. Don't go into that quiet place and be like, okay, I'm just gonna repeat a bunch of prayers and meaningless words because if I pray, like the pastor said, I'll be having a relationship with God. God, I pray I have a great day. Amen. Dang, I got 59 minutes and 56 seconds left of my rental here at the library. What am I supposed to do? Oh, shucks. Let's just watch Netflix. No, you give him your heart. You talk to your God like you would talk to a friend. Once you get that intentional moment and that intentional space, what's on your heart in that moment? Praise him. Thank him. Put in your own words the things you want to say to your God and Father. Sometimes I find myself not thinking about what I'm praying about. Has that ever happened to you? Right? My kids... Uh, model this often when we're sitting at the dining room table, they go because they're starving and they want to pray and I'm legalistic and I don't let them eat until they've prayed. And I say, all right, let's pray. And Josiah goes, God, I pray that we have a great day at school in Jesus name. Amen. Or Esther says, uh, God, I pray that I'd have a good night, that I a good night's sleep. I mean, for the food. Amen. And when I'm in the car on the way to school in the morning with Eden, because we're not thinking yet, because it's so early in the morning, we're driving there and we say, God, I pray that uh, you would help me know it's Friday and that I'd have a great day. Amen. I said to her once, totally rude and snarky, because that's apparently the mood I'm in today. I said, <laughs> praise God. He just answered your prayer. 
because you know it's Friday. As an adult, I don't want to move to this. I don't want to uh, be in this place in my relationship with God where it's, it's in vain, where meaningless words are coming out. What's going on in your heart? If you met with me as your friend, not as your pastor, and I say, hey, what's up? How's your life? Tell me what's good. Tell me, tell me what you're struggling with. Tell me uh, you know, what you're afraid about, what you're worried about. You would have no trouble talking to me about that. That's prayer. God hears and knows what's going on in your heart. And whether you say the words out loud or you say them in the quietness of your own thoughts and in your own heart, that is how you're building a relationship with God through intentionality and spontaneity. Some people are very disciplined in their prayers. That is a good thing, but it also can be a bad thing. Some people are very spontaneous in their prayers. That can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. We need both. You need date night and random phone calls. You need to buy flowers on Valentine's Day and also on a random Tuesday. You need to give a card on your anniversary and also a sweet text in the middle of the week. You need to have a business conversation about what's going on on your schedule, and you also need to have a time of heart sharing. You need to have dinner and talk as a family. You need to be in the car and talk with your friend. You need to start a conversation with someone that you've offended by addressing it and apologizing and then getting into the conversation. This is what we know how to do in our relationships. This is very similar to what God wants from us. He wants you and your heart to respond to his love for you by saying, I want to spend time with the God who loves me, who wants to hear from me, and who wants to speak to me in return. So that's why the very next thing that Jesus says is not on the, uh, on the screen, but you know it. Jesus says, so pray in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first thing that Jesus teaches us to pray is God Help me to see how glorious you are. If a relationship with God is difficult or seems hard, that's a great place to start. God, I want to see you as hallowed and holy and set apart. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's a, a request. It's, a, it's an ask. God, May your name be hallowed to me. And so a relationship with God is not about the right words or the duration of your words or the content of your words or the theological precision of your words or the repetition of your words. It's about the overflow of your heart to your Father who is in heaven. So as we close today, I want to encourage you in three ways to put this into practice. The first is... I want to uh, have you take some intentional time for all of these, but to set apart time with God every day. This week, today is a great place to start. Intentional time with God every day. Where you arrive at the meeting, God's at the meeting because you had a scheduled appointment that it was going to be there in your bed when you first wake up or in your car on the way to work or during your lunch break when you walk outside away from everybody else uh, at the job. It's going to be intentional for each one of us. You can't just look at my life and say, well, what do you do? Because my life is different than yours. Intentionally every day to set apart time with God. That's the first thing. And then the next thing is also to have spontaneous, short and sweet time with God throughout the day. You see something that uh, makes you think about God, tell him. You saw the sunrise this morning with the purples and the orange, and you go, wow, isn't that amazing? Tell him. Send him that little text throughout the day that, to let him know you were thinking about him. Spontaneous, short and sweet time with God throughout the day. And then the last thing I want to encourage us to think about as 
uh, Christians and as a church is to also have planned time with God, longer durations of time together that are not rushed or not pressed. On a Saturday, you and your family work it out so that you can have two hours with God somewhere. You work it out in your schedule in your life where, where you take an entire uh, Friday night into uh, Saturday morning to spend time with God without devices, with your Bible, a notebook, and you pray. Now, I know uh, some of us uh, think that's crazy, and you might be thinking of excuses why that can't happen, uh, but it's beautiful. At our leaders meeting this past month, rather than us meeting at a certain time to eat and then pray and then talk about some uh, matters, but then also know that it's getting late and we have to go. It was Martin Luther King Day, so we met at the beginning. We met at four rather than six. And so from four to six, we prayed. I walked out of that time with my brothers and sisters praying for an hour and a half together in different ways. So desirous of God. If someone had said, hey, I think we should stay here for another hour. I would have been the first one to sign up. It was so sweet. Sometimes you need extra time. I know about my wife and I, when, if and when we do go on a date, often the first date that we have after a while is all business. We're finally together. And so for that hour we've set apart, it's who's taking who to the soccer game? What time is the appointment? Oh, yeah, so-and-so told me to tell you that the water temperature at the church is messed up. <laughs> I need more time to catch up on the list of things that we needed to talk about. And so that doesn't happen if you only give the person in your life this much time. We need to plan longer times with God. This is what life is all about. So... Here's the question I'll leave with us today. Do you want to take your relationship with God to the next level, or do you want to stay where you are? That's the question. If, you, if you're content with where you are and you want to stay there, you already know what to do. But if you want to take your relationship with God into a deeper, closer, more wonderful next level, then today what we've discussed is the first step in that direction. Let's pray. Close your books and take a breath. Get quiet. Father, I want to thank you for meeting with us today and being open, uh, having ears open to listen to our prayers. God, I just want to want to come to you now and I want to thank you for loving me and for loving us. God, thanks for uh, how you've uh, delivered us. And man, it's just, I can be such a fool. And yet you still are ready when I say, Heavenly Father, here I am. Thanks. You're not like anybody else I know. You're just so faithful and good. You're so loving. You're so willing to forgive. You're and sometimes, God, even when I'm, I'm wandering, you come after me and start the conversation. Thank you for that. Lord, I just pray that you would grow us as a church to uh, be more mature and to be deeper in our relationship with you, to, to be intentional about it, and to also uh, enjoy the sponta spontaneity that comes up in our day, Lord. But just more and more and more and more and more and more and more, our lives could be about you and being with you and yeah, being more and more like a friend. God, I praise you for being the strong God of deliverance and creative power and justice and wrath and judgment and covenant keeping faithfulness and the God that is small enough to hear from little old me. There's none like you. And God, we want more and more to be in your presence and to not go anywhere that you're not going to be. 
So help us this week, Lord, with intentionality, with spontaneity, with plans that we might make. Lord, and let us be shaped by our time with you like nothing else can shape us. In the name of Jesus, amen.